have to be honest going into this one. Pokemon Platinum is my favorite entry in the series, and it will be difficult to completely remove myself from my past experience with the game. I will do my best to remove bias as we explore, but I probably won't be able to cull it entirely. I'd like to think there's a reason for my ongoing affection for the game, though, and I'm interested to dive in and discover how it holds up today. As a quick reminder, this is the fourth video in an ongoing series of videos analyzing the Pokemon series. If a concept has been explored before, it will not come up again unless something about it has changed. With that, let's begin. This time around we're exploring the Sinnoh region, a colder northern region with 107 new Pokemon and a regional deck sized to 210. It's one of the best to date, with excellent Pokemon distribution and most types being available early into the game. The moment we take a step, we're introduced to Barry, the rival this time around. He's a polarizing rival to say the least. He is incredibly hyperactive and impatient, and you might wonder why the two of you are friends at all. Like many games in the series, growing up in the same town and being around the same age seems to have made him and the player friends despite Barry's overwhelming personality. A reasonable explanation. Step outside and we see the impact of a leap to a new platform once again. Day and night impact the overworld and Pokemon spawns again, and the overworld is now presented in 3D. As usual, this is the best looking game so far, but unfortunately the 3D overworld comes at a cost. The game has returned to running at 30 FPS, and the impact of this can be felt everywhere. In the overworld, in menus, in battles, even when saving the game. I couldn't fault you if this hurt your enjoyment of the game, but to compensate, the beginning of the game is paced in such a way that you'll be through the unfortunately mandatory catching tutorial in about the same amount of time it took an emerald. After getting caught up in Barry's reckless plan to get a Pokemon, Professor Rowan shows up with Don or Lucas, depending on your player character, and after a test of character, decides to give you one, introducing us to the new starters, Turtwig, Chimchar, and Piplum. This is another fantastic set of starter Pokemon, and you can't really go wrong with any of the choices here. They all end up with great stats and move pools, and have unique type combinations that create a reverse type triangle. Grass Ground, Fire Fighting, and Water Steel. Since fire types are rare in this generation, I'll be going with Chimchar this time around. This is the first battle in some time that takes place right after you pick your starter, and as such it's a crapshoot whether you end up winning or losing which makes taking money from you if you lose, even if it's not much, a poor design decision. I suppose it teaches you the consequences of losing a trainer battle early, but come on, why? Afterwards, Barry takes you to the lakefront, where we have a brief encounter with a man with grandiose plans before Barry realizes that his plans to catch the legendary here are dashed because he forgot Pokeballs. This isn't the first time he's shown being scatterbrained, and it certainly won't be the last. Now that we're free to traverse the tall grass, we'll encounter the traditional regional rodent, bird, and bug, but this time around you should seriously consider the bird and the rodent. Bidoof ends up able to learn a great deal of HM moves it is incredibly useful for exploration, and Starly is hands down the best regional bird in the franchise due to its great stats and shockingly wide move pool. You'll probably end up with your first new move soon enough, which brings us to one of the biggest changes Generation 4 has to offer, and one of the most important changes in the franchise, the physical special split. Instead of falling under a blanket classification of physical or special depending on type, individual moves can be classified as either physically based or specially based. Moves like Bite, Thunder Punch, and Dragon Claw now work based on the user's physical attack stat as you would expect, giving more options to Pokemon who were dreadfully mistyped before and overall expanding the strategic possibilities of the game on both a casual and competitive level. After being dragged around Sand Gem Town, being taught about Pokemon Centers and Pokemarts, and sitting through the catching tutorial, we enter Jubilife City and meet Looker, a recurring character we'll see far into the future of the series. He's a member of the International Police on the trail of this game's villainous team, and we'll be crossing paths with him regularly as we deal with them. Nearly every time we encounter him, he'll give us something. This time it's the VS Recorder. This was a function of the Frontier Pass in Emerald, but now you can record and replay battles with friends from very early on in your adventure, one of a number of things that encourages playing the game with friends. 
This seems like a good time to mention that the bag finally has infinite space for items, and thankfully this continues going forward in the series. We're forced into the trainer school to deliver a package to Barry and receive the town map before Barry runs off. There's two trainers here who use X items in battle, but I don't think this demonstration is particularly effective since all the Pokemon involved are still weak. We're interrupted again by the Poketch company president, and before we can move on, we have to answer incredibly simple quizzes from three clowns in the city to get coupons towards the new Poketch. All these interruptions are a nuisance for experienced players, but at least it's a relatively quick process and will force new players to become familiar with long-established staples of the series. Trade in the coupons and we get the Poketch, a great way to utilize the screen space afforded by the dual screens of the DS giving you access to features the player might find helpful like the clock, a symbol calculator, your party status, and more as we progress through the game. Heading onwards, we're immediately challenged by Barry. This early in the game, he's not much of a challenge regardless of starter choice. There's a few items clearly visible throughout the route that will challenge newcomers to go off the beaten path into more risky territory for a small reward. At the end of the route is Orberg Gate, where we're given the HM for Rock Smash. Yes, unfortunately, Rock Smash returns as an HM, and although its power was increased slightly, it's still a bad move. The only branch in the cave is blocked by breakable rocks, so it's a straight shot to Orberg City, a mining town with machinery lying around the mine and plenty of workers who work with Machop. It's another great instance of the relationship between people and Pokemon being clearly demonstrated in an everyday scenario. The gym leader, Rourke, is in Orberg Mine, which is technically the first dungeon. It's a straight line in a circle. I appreciate the brevity, but a bit more effort could have made this a more memorable location. The first gym is standard fare. A way around all the trainers, everybody uses rock types, you get the drill. Like an emerald, you're not likely to struggle with any starter here since rock is weak to water, grass, and fighting, and by this point your starter has probably evolved. Rourke does have a couple tricks up his sleeve, though. His signature move is Stealth Rock, a move which isn't often useful in single player but is infamous in competitive circles for its ability to immediately remove up to half of an opponent's health upon switching in depending on their resistance to rock type moves. His Onyx uses Screech to lower your defense, which doesn't help Onyx very much but is incredibly helpful for his Cranidos, a Pokemon with a ridiculously high attack stat, especially for this point in the game. If you're not careful, you could definitely lose here. I suppose now's a good time to mention that the Pokemon Centers in this game use a mellow remix of the traditional Pokemon Center theme at night. It's very soothing, and I really wish they kept this detail in future games. Soon enough, you'll beat Roark and earn the Coal Badge. The route to the north of town can't be traversed without a bike, so it's back through Orberg Gate. You can access the basement floor now and pick up Flash, which thankfully has become a TM and will never become an HM again. The rest of the cave is inaccessible without more HMs and a bike, so we'll keep this in mind for later and return to Jubilife. Now that we have a badge, we can access the global terminal. Unfortunately, we can't actually do anything here today since the online service for DS games has gone offline. But when it was functional, this was a gigantic leap forward for the series. Gone were the days of link cables and local only play. Generation 4 was the first generation to standardize wireless communication and online play for the series. It's part of why the competitive community has been able to grow to the size it is today. It became easier than ever to trade and battle with other players, and the core online features remain with the series to this day. Heading to the north, we have our first encounter with Team Galactic and battle alongside our counterpart to take them out. As per usual, they're nothing special, but they use two version-exclusive Pokémon not available in Platinum. The road ahead is mostly uneventful. We pass through the extremely brief Ravaged Path to Floroma Town, noting points we can return to for secrets once we get the proper HMs. Floroma doesn't offer much besides the first berry patches we have access to, this region's flower shop, and a load of flowers all throughout the town. If we leave town, we're asked to save this girl's father from Team Galactic, who also happens to be blocking the bridge. The grunt in front of the Valley Windworks is a pushover, but in a surprisingly smart move, he locks himself in the building once defeated. Grunts in Floroma Meadow have the key, and they've decided to harass this man for honey so they can... attract Pokémon? 
This is just one of many stupid things the grunts say or do, and Platinum is refreshingly self-aware about how stupid they are as the game progresses. Once they're tossed aside, we're given some honey for free and can use it on special honey trees across the region, introducing us to one of the worst mechanics in the series. Remember Headbutt and Crystal? Honey trees essentially serve the same purpose, but on a fixed timer. Slather a tree with honey and wait six real-life hours for something to appear. And like with Headbutt, this is the only way to obtain some Pokémon, including the ludicrously rare Munchlax. A new pre-evolution for Snorlax that has a 1% encounter rate on only four random trees in the game. If the Pokémon you encounter isn't what you want, you can't just reset either. You have to wait six more hours to get another chance to find what you want. It's a spectacular waste of time and I'm glad they've never revisited this concept. Now that we can enter the Windworks, we can wipe the floor with a few more Galactic Grunts and face Commander Mars. She isn't too difficult to deal with, but her Perugly's speed might catch you off guard. Fun fact, Glammeow and Perugly are the most neglected Pokémon in the series so far. The only game you can reliably obtain them in before the postgame is in Pokémon Pearl, making them the only Pokémon so far that you can only obtain in a single game even several generations after release. With Mars defeated and Galactic given the boot, we learn that Drifloom will appear outside the Valley Windworks every Friday, reintroducing weekly events, albeit to a lesser extent than in Generation 2. Route 205 is a somewhat long route with varied trainer battles in several areas we can return to later with more HMs in hand. To proceed, we have to go through a turn of forests, the first proper dungeon of the game, and we meet Cheryl at the entrance. She asks to go with us, introducing the first of what are referred to as the Stat Trainers. Cheryl is the only one you're required to meet, but occasionally you'll encounter a trainer like her who will accompany you in an area, battling alongside you and healing your team after each battle. As such, they're useful to have around. They serve as an excellent introduction to double and multi-battles and can help players who want to grind save time on healing. Eterna Forest isn't too complicated, branching occasionally around the middle and giving players the choice between fighting trainers and taking their chances in the tall grass. Soon enough, we're out of the forest, Cheryl bids us farewell, and we arrive in Eterna City. We meet Barry once again, who takes us to see the statue in the middle of town, where we see Cyrus musing about Sinnoh's mythology. Mythology is Platinum's thematic focus, and many characters throughout the game discuss the myths and legends surrounding the Sinnoh region and Pokémon world at large. One of them is Cynthia, who is implied to have been on a Pokédex journey herself but now studies mythology. Like Steven, we'll be encountering her frequently throughout the game. If we exit town to the north, we reach an entrance to Mount Coronet, a large dungeon that divides Sinnoh into two halves. We can't go very far into this side yet, though there are a few items and trainers around this area if you take the time to explore. There's an incredibly gaudy building in the north of town we can't access without cut, which we can use after clearing the next gym. This is a grass-type gym, and I would bet most people have at least one answer to grass-type so far, be it a fire, flying, or bug-type. The puzzle here isn't so much a puzzle as it is a cosmetic gimmick. To feed a trainer, to turn the hands on the flower clock in the middle, to feed all three to reach the gym leader, Gardenia. Though her team is all grass types, it packs a few surprises. Turtwig has moves that support the rest of its team, and if it uses Sunny Day, her Charm will be significantly stronger. Her ace, Roserade, has the highest stats we've seen so far and may give you trouble as a result. For defeating her, we get the forest badge and can enter the Galactic Building. We can't just skip town since both ways forward require a bicycle and the bike shop owner is stuck inside. Licker greets us once again, having disguised himself as a galactic grunt, and their stupidity is pointed out once more. The grunts in here are all guarding the wrong places. You can make it through the entire building without fighting a single one if you don't want to. At the top is Commander Jupiter, holding the bike shop owner's Pokemon hostage, and she's surprisingly easy to take down. She uses a Skun Tank, which has a unique type combination of Poison Dark that only leaves it weak to ground type moves, but its stats are mostly unremarkable. After defeating her, Team Galactic leaves once again and the bike shop owner tells us to see him at the shop. Cynthia greets us once again and gives us an egg. It'll hatch into Togepi, and if you need a flying type, you might want to keep it around this time. 
We're given a bicycle by the shop owner, which functions similarly to the mock bike from Emerald, although it's much easier to control. We can only leave town once we've picked up the Explorer Kit and used it at least once to reach the Underground. A huge side area with a heavy multiplayer focus that houses this game's secret bases, a Capture the Flag minigame, and a Diggy minigame that earns you fossils, items, and spears that can be traded in for secret base decorations. It's a great side mode to play with friends, but unfortunately it was never playable online, so I would guess that a lot of people never got the chance to experience everything it has to offer. With Cut, we could explore the old chateau in Eterna Forest. It's a small building, but it's filled with ghost Pokémon, and every so often you'll see a ghost leaving a room. Combined with the music, it has an eerie atmosphere to it. You'll also find the Droid Plate here, one of 16 plates that correspond to a mythical Pokémon, and each has engravings with part of the mythos of said Pokémon on it. This is also where you can find Rotom, a unique electric ghost type with the ability to possess appliances. Unfortunately, the way to get Rotom to change forms in Platinum is locked behind an event that has long since passed, but will be available in future titles. Rotom becomes more important in later games, for better or worse. Cycling Road, as always, has trainers to battle, but is a straight path through. The underside of Cycling Road has a few items and unique Pokémon and houses the entrance to Wayward Cave. Or rather, entrances. This hiker suggests that there are two entrances, and if you check under the road you'll discover an optional part of the cave that has a few rare items as a reward for discovering it, along with being the only place to catch Gibble, this game's powerful pseudo-legendary Pokémon akin to Dratini, Larvitar, or Bagon from games past. Gibble's fully evolved form is one of the best Pokémon in the series, and all of this is a fantastic reward for those who go off the beaten path and pay attention to NPC dialogue. The main part of the cave has small rewards for exploration as well. Another stat trainer, Mira, can be found at the edge of the maze, making this a great spot to gain experience. And there are plenty of hidden items found throughout the cave guarded by trainers. Moving on, we're stopped by our counterpart at the entrance to Mount Coronet. They give us the VS Seeker and the Dowsing Machine, two very useful items. The Dowsing Machine is installed to the Pokatch and is what the item finder should have been displaying nearby hidden items on a grid and giving you their exact location. The VS Seeker allows you to rematch trainers you can see on screen without having to wait for them to become available again like in Crystal or Emerald. For some unfortunate reason, this is the second and last time it ever appears in the series, and the last time regular trainers could be rematched for extra cash and experience. In Mount Coronet, we're stopped again by Cyrus, who laments the state of the world before walking off. The next route has a number of places we'll have to return to, along with this man who gives us an odd keystone in this game's Berry Master. Here we're given a Poketch app that lets us track berry locations across the region. And by this point, the utility the Poketch can provide should become clear. There's a lot of utility to it by the end of the game. Hard Home City has a few areas of interest. As usual, we can't leave until we clear the gym, but there's also this region's Pokemon fan club, Amity Square, which serves as a testing area for the much-beloved feature where your Pokémon walk with you in the overworld, and the Contest Hall. Contests return once again and are a bit different this time around. The general preparation process is the same, but the contest structure is much more involved than before. The first round is an appeal round where you decorate your Pokémon with accessories you can find throughout the game and try to match the theme given to you, then show off to the crowd. The second round is a light rhythm game. Match your opponent's moves during their turn, keep the beat while attempting to throw them off during yours. The last round is similar to how the appeal round went before, but with two key changes. There are three judges to appeal to instead of one, making you anticipate who your opponents might try to appeal to, as the less Pokemon appeal to a judge, the more they stand out. Turn order also generally goes from worst to best, giving those struggling a chance to catch up again. Though simple, the changes added here make this a much more engaging process than before, and for winning there's a brand new set of ribbons for your Pokémon. Enough dilly-dallying, it's time for the gym. This gym is a ghost-type gym. It's totally dark, and you're given a flashlight to make your way through. Find the blue tile on the floor with a pattern and head to the door with a matching pattern to advance. It's possible to go through without fighting any trainers if you so choose, and to the end is Fantina. 
she's no pushover, especially since you're not all that likely to have a ghost or dark type to deal with her at this point in time. And she uses a Haunter and Miss Magius, both of which have irritating status inflicting moves and are quick and powerful. She gives you the Relic Badge upon defeating her, which will let us use the Fog. We'll get to that eventually. There's not much else to do in Heart Home, but we can pick up an Eevee from Bebe, this region's PC storage admin. This brings me to a huge trend in Generation 4's roster of new Pokémon, Evolutions and Pre-Evolutions. There's a bunch of both for older Pokémon, like Munchlax is a pre-evolution for Snorlax, and we've already seen a few others like Roserade and Mesmagius. Nearly a quarter of the new Pokémon are related to existing Pokémon, serving the same purpose as Generation 2, breathing new life into old Pokémon and giving earlier access to some of the stronger ones. This has its disadvantages though. Most of the baby Pokemon this generation either belong to families that aren't particularly great or have obtuse evolution conditions. And although design is very subjective, a lot of people aren't fans of how the new evolutions look, especially for memorable Pokemon like Rhydon and Lickitung. It also leads to a lot of the new Pokemon feeling much less new due to their connections to established Pokemon. That being said, most of the new additions are great, necessary or not, and Leafeon is no exception. With it in hand, we can move on to Route 209. Right at the gate, Barry challenges us to another battle. His team has started to fill out, and he has the classic type trio along with his Staravia. If Fantina didn't challenge you, Barry just might. His team should be around your level, and if you haven't picked up on the value of team diversity, he'll certainly demonstrate it for you. Just past him is the Hollowed Tower. We slot in the odd keystone we were given earlier and... nothing happens. This is another obtuse encounter method akin to Feebas. If you encounter 32 people in the underground after you put the keystone in, Spiritomb will appear from the tower. While it's a great reward, boasting excellent defensive stats and a typing that has no weaknesses in this generation, it's not easy to obtain or hinted at very well in-game. Gen 4 seems to be the last time Game Freak decided to utilize obscure encounter methods, for better or worse. Part of me laments that secrets like Spiritomb and Feebas are no more, but I also realize that most players will never get to find Pokemon like these due to how convoluted their encounter criteria can be. The Lost Tower is just ahead, this game's Pokemon Cemetery. It's the smallest yet and has the least to offer. There are a few trainer battles in here, and some good items, but most players can skip this one without losing out on much. Worth noting is that it's the first instance of fog in the overworld, and with it the first use of defog. It's like Flash, but worse in every way. It has a similarly worthless effect in battle, at least in this generation, and its use is optional. Unlike Flash, fog is a weather condition that affects battles as well. Every Pokemon in battle now has a higher chance of missing attacks, making getting through foggy areas doable but incredibly frustrating. When we reach Solaceon Town, Barry tells us to check out the ruins in town and pick up the HM for Defog. These ruins are a semi-optional dungeon with many items to pick up throughout and yet another home of unknown. And after last time, if you think I'm going to be catching all the unknown again, you're out of your- Ugh. At least this time there are tangible rewards for doing so. One of them we'll get to in due time, but the other is related to a new feature, Ball Capsules. You can customize your Pokeballs with seals to create custom entrance animations for your Pokemon that even show up in PvP, and each unknown letter you collect gets you the corresponding letter as a seal. This is yet another feature that was cut entirely, which is a real shame. Having the option to personalize your team even further is always a plus. Route 210 is a brief route if you don't go off the beaten path, reintroducing very tall grass, which doesn't get seen very frequently going forward. It's nice aesthetically and gives some variety to environments, but it's annoying being unable to bike through it. A Psyduck are blocking the way forward to the north, so we have to detour onto Route 215, which as usual has a number of trainers in your way, but also has a handful of cuttable trees that reward you with items or a shortcut for keeping the move around. At the end of the route is a fairly tough double battle that may catch you unprepared after the previous trainer battles on the route. Incidentally, double battles have been fixed starting with this generation. Replacements are now sent in at the end of the turn to prevent multiple unavoidable knockouts. After that we arrive in Veilstone City. It's an upscale town with a very seedy atmosphere conveyed by the music and dialogue of various NPCs around town. It's almost like a throwback to Celadon City, 
It houses the region's department store and game corner, and directly in the north of town we find the galactic headquarters out in the open, masquerading as an energy company. The game corner even has ties to Team Galactic, sporting their symbol on the slot reels. This is the last time a game corner appears in the series, which is a mostly acceptable loss in my eyes. Even though it removes a side activity, it's not the best idea to keep gambling in a series that's supposed to be kid-friendly. Finally, there's the gym. This one is a fighting gym with a puzzle surrounding punching bags that you push across rails to knock over stacks of tires in your way. It's fairly simple, but is a good demonstration of what the 3D overworld brings to the table and provides small spatial reasoning puzzles to tease the brain. None of the trainers here are of much consequence, especially if you have a flying or psychic type on your team, and considering the Starly line is so good, it's pretty likely a lot of players will. The gym leader, Maylene, isn't much different but has some tricks up her sleeve. She carries Rock Tomb on her first two Pokemon to deal with your flying types, and her Lucario is pretty threatening. It's fast, hits hard, and carries Drain Punch. Like Kika Drain, it absorbs half the damage it deals to heal itself. If you chose Chimchar, you're at an advantage since Lucario is weak to fire and fighting, but underestimating it is still a bad idea. Win here and we get the Cobble Badge and the ability to use Fly. When we exit the gym, your counterpart will ask for help getting their Pokedex back from Team Galactic at their warehouse. As per usual, they're pathetic. You'll get the Pokedex back and the grunts flee into the building. Looker arrives to inspect the warehouse and mentions that galactic activity has been reported in Pastoria City, which happens to be our next destination. To get there, we go through Route 214, which is a high road with few encounters and a low road with many encounters and more items. It's also home to the Dig Maniacs Tunnel, which gets dug deeper and deeper as you catch more unknown letters. For getting every unknown letter, you reach the top chamber in the Solaceon Ruins, and your reward for collecting all 26 letters of the alphabet is... Two more forms of unknown! Yay! Okay, there's also rare candy, but man, it's a reward, but it's not really worth the time. Past Route 214 is the Valor Lakefront, the Hotel Grand Lake, and Route 213, which is a straight shot through to Pastoria if you want it to be, but if you want to take the time to explore, there are plenty of trainers and optional items to find. Pastoria City is home to the next gym and the Great Marsh, this region's safari zone and the last one in the series so far. And what a whimper to go out on. The Great Marsh has a good name, being a marsh as the name implies, but the Pokemon variety is lackluster as a result, you get stuck in the swamp areas, making traversal tedious, and the safari game is just as bad as always. Before you can enter the next gym, Barry challenges you yet again, and besides being higher leveled, his team is identical to the last time we saw him. If you beat him then, you can beat him now. The next gym is a water gym, and this time the puzzle revolves around changing the tide with switches to reach different areas around the gym. You'll probably have options to deal with water types by now, but Crash or Wake might still give you trouble anyway. Like many others, he packs a Gyarados and a Quagsire to counter Grass and Electric types respectively, but his Floatzel is a real threat. It's likely higher level than you at this point, it's very fast, and it's packing Ice Fang to deal with Grass types. Beat him and we get the Fen Badge and the ability to use Surf. Barry tells us something is going on at the Great Marsh, and just moments later a bomb goes off. A galactic grunt emerges from the marsh, very proud of himself for endangering people and wildlife, and we give chase. Many times. He eventually challenges us and, as usual, is a pushover, and ends up just getting away in the end. Cynthia shows up after he leaves and gives us the secret potion to use on the Psyduck we saw earlier. Before we do that, we could explore Route 212 to the west of Pastoria, a long and varied route that starts out as a bog, becomes a small lake, winds into a grove, and ends in a garden. It's quite varied, and there are many trainers to battle and secrets to collect throughout the route, and a few points to come back to later. Back on track, when we heal the Psyduck on Route 210, Cynthia asks us to deliver a charm to her grandmother in the next town. To get there, we have to cross the north path of Route 210, the first mandatory area in the game with Fog. Like I mentioned earlier, fog is a colossal nuisance, limiting your visibility in the overworld and prolonging battles by making attacks miss. And there are several mandatory encounters on this route, so if you don't pack an extra Pokemon to use Defog, you're in for an incredibly frustrating time as you cross the ravine. 
Celestic Town is very rustic and full of mythological tales, with NPCs telling tales about the town and the history of Sinnoh itself. The cave at the center is being blocked by a galactic grunt threatening to blow up the town, but ultimately he's all talk and goes down like a chump. The cave painting in the ruins depicts three Pokemon surrounding an orb, and as we contemplate this, Cyrus appears to question the Elder about its meaning and challenges us after the Elder refuses to answer him, revealing himself to be the boss of Team Galactic. His team is close in level to what yours should be at this point, but is incomplete in evolution and number. He surmises the answer to his question from the Elder's response and retreats, and for stopping the Galactic members were given the HM for a surf, and as usual, this opens up Sinnoh quite a bit for us. We're pointed towards Canalave City, and since there's not much we can do in Route 213 or Mount Coronet quite yet, that's our next destination. After the incredibly brief Route 218, we arrive in Canalave City, a small port town with a relaxing atmosphere and a few notable attractions. The next gym is here, as well as the library and the ferry out of town. Crossing the bridge, Barry challenges us to another battle, and his team is filling out yet again with all of his Pokemon being evolved in a new addition in Heracross. If you don't have a variety of Pokemon at your disposal, Barry is likely to have at least one that will stop you dead in your tracks. After you beat him, he brags about his plan to become the champion and suggests we train on Iron Island before tackling the next gym. We'll have to go there to pick up strength regardless, but training in there isn't a bad idea. Another one of the stat trainers, Riley, will join up with you on your way through, and there's plenty of trainers to battle and items to find throughout the cave. After dispatching some galactic grunts, Riley offers you an egg, which will hatch into a Riolu, the pre-evolved form of Lucario. It's an excellent Pokemon and a great reward for going through the dungeon. The next gym is a Steel-type gym, which will be a pain to deal with if you don't have fighting, fire, or ground-type moves at your disposal. By this point, most players probably will, but the general bulk steel types tend to have makes this a more intense gym than most in terms of battles. The puzzle isn't too difficult though. Use the lifts to navigate a multi-story maze and make your way to the gym leader, Byron. If you can get through the trainers below, Byron shouldn't be much different. His Steelix is astonishingly bulky and can dish out heavy hits, but get through it and you'll earn the Mime Badge and the ability to use strength. Once we leave, Barry tells us that Professor Rowan wants to meet us at the library, where he tasks us with investigating the three lakes of Sinnoh when all of a sudden... An earthquake occurs, and a TV report tells us that a bomb went off at Lake Valor, which by chance is the lake Rowan wanted us to investigate anyway. There's no time to lose, except if you'd like to read up on Sinnoh mythology here, in which case knock yourself out. Indeed, Team Galactic bombed the lake like they bombed the Great Marsh, revealing a cavern below the surface. The grunts on the way there are still pretty pathetic, but they're at least more formidable in terms of level this time around. Inside the cavern, we meet the last commander, Saturn, who is surprisingly easy at this point in the game. His Toxicroak is the only Pokemon that could even fire off a move, but he still went down with ease. We learned that Team Galactic has already taken the legendary Pokemon here and are aiming to seize the ones of the other lakes so it's off to Verity to help Rowan and our counterpart. Side note, I really like Professor Rowan. Multiple times he demonstrates that he's a no-nonsense sort of person, even in the face of danger, which is incredibly admirable for someone his age. The grunts here are no worse than the ones from before, but will challenge you to multi-battles, and Mars hasn't improved much from the last time we saw her. From here we're asked to check up on Barry at Lake Acuity requiring us to go through Mount Coronet's northern entrance, travel a bit deeper within, and walk out to one of my favorite moments in the series. The atmosphere on Route 216 is phenomenal. The music gives it a tranquil feeling that advances to a more adventurous sounding melody as it goes on, matching the gradual shift from a calm, snowy area to a brutal snowstorm that you're more than capable of handling at this point. However, I definitely understand why people have gripes with this part of the game. Between the blinding snow and the dreadfully slow pace in which you walk through it, and an already slow game engine, this part is a total slog if you aren't invested. Partway through, we find the HM for rock climb, and when we reach the Acuity Lakefront, Barry tells us we'll need the next badge to use it. This is definitely the game where HM use gets out of hand. There are 8 moves required for overworld traversal, one being optional but irritating to not have, 
Fly being so convenient it's practically necessary, and two being scarce after the first half of the game. That's a third of your party's total moveset completely dedicated to HM moves, and of those moves, only Surf, Waterfall, and maybe Fly are truly useful. I appreciate the variety all these HMs bring to the landscape of Sinnoh and how they make the environments feel more natural, as well as making your individual Pokémon feel more important, but essentially having to forego one or two party slots for the sake of conveniently traversing the overworld while maintaining a solid team for battling is a huge nuisance. There's got to be a better way to achieve this. The next town, Snowpoint City, doesn't house very much we can access right now besides the next gym. An ice gym, complete with my favorite, sliding ice style puzzles. This one has you using slopes to increase your velocity and crash through snowballs in your path on the way to the gym leader. At least it's an interesting spatial awareness puzzle. Like Price and Crystal, Candace suffers from being an ice type trainer late in the game. You have plenty of options to deal with ice types at this point, and the only Pokemon that might throw you off is Frostlass since it's part ghost and thus immune to fighting type moves, and Pax Psychic to dispatch any fighting types you have. Still, she should go down pretty easily and we get the Icicle Badge, letting us follow Barry to discover... he lost? To Jupiter? He doesn't seem to have taken it very well either. Fair enough, considering it means they got away with the Legendary in tow. Jupiter told us not to follow her back to the Veilstone hideout, so that's our next destination. We obviously can't just break into the front entrance, which is exactly why we tried to do so talking to the pitiful grunt outside who bemoans his situation before running away. Licker tells us to meet him at the warehouse and we sneak through that way, doing the standard base infiltrating routine at this point. Battle grunts, find items, use warp tiles, find a key to progress further, get a fitting reward for backtracking to a door for said key. Pretty standard fare by this point. At one point you interrupt a speech by Cyrus that further demonstrates his cult leader persona, promising grandeur to the members of Team Galactic, only to discover moments later when you confront him that his speech, predictably, was a lie. He wants the power to create a new world all to himself, and challenges us yet again. His team has improved quite a bit, but still isn't too threatening yet. The level difference will likely be the biggest hurdle to overcome in this fight, along with Crobat's speed and Honchkrow's power. Before defeating him, he recognizes our worth and gives us a Master Ball, announcing his departure to the peak of Mount Coronet to complete his machinations. In the adjacent room, we can talk to scientists who express regret over the experiments they performed on the Lake Trio and fight Saturn again to free them. Saturn isn't much harder than last time, but if you neglected to heal your team after your encounter with Cyrus, you might pay for that decision. With the Lake Trio freed, it's time to follow Cyrus to the top of Mount Coronet. Scaling a Mount Coronet, there are a few galactic grunts that will block your path, but most of them can be dodged as you ascend the mountain. The visual upgrade brought by having a 3D overworld is readily apparent here. It definitely feels like you're scaling a mountain inside and out, with plenty of side paths to come back to later. As we get closer to the top, battles with grunts become unavoidable, though they serve more to wear you down than to provide an actual challenge. Mars and Jupiter challenge you yet again, but Barry arrives to turn this into a multi-battle. Surprisingly, they're pretty tough, partially due to the level difference and partially due to the AI actually making smart decisions. This is an extremely strange situation where I strongly recommend knocking out Barry's Munchlax as soon as possible, otherwise it'll use moves to stall out turns. This isn't a viable strategy against the AI, much less in a double battle. We arrive too late though, and Cyrus successfully summons and controls Dialga and Palkia, starting the creation of his ideal universe. All seems lost when a little interruption occurs. After Cyrus is swallowed up and his underlings are left in shock, Cynthia arrives and we have to give chase into the interloper's home turf, the Distortion World. This is one of the most unique locations in the franchise and one of my favorite dungeons ever. 
It's an incredibly unique landscape where the laws of physics break and shift on a whim. Some walls are floors, platforms appear and disappear, you descend an upside down waterfall. It's a chaotic location very fitting of the Pokemon representing antimatter and a joy to traverse. Once we reach the bottom, Cyrus challenges us again and this is the toughest fight so far. His team is fully evolved, fast, and packs a punch. Although there's a common weakness to electric types throughout his lineup, his Pokemon's movesets have coverage to deal with the various Pokemon you might be carrying, and they're all likely to be higher level than your party at this point. If you lose here, you have a long walk of shame all the way back to this point. Beat him and he taunts you into confronting Giratina, claiming that defeating it will break down the distortion worlds and make his plans become reality. This turns out not to be the case, however. If you defeat, capture, or even just run away from Giratina, his plans fall through all the same. He goes off on a rant towards us before going deeper into the distortion world, never to be seen again, ending the Team Galactic plotline. I'm a big fan of how it plays out. The bigger picture and overall goal of Cyrus is ambitious and spelled out for you if you're paying attention. And although individual grunts are portrayed in a refreshing way, the group is clearly presented to be dangerous in a way few other teams are giving you an actual reason to want to stop them. Because of how close he gets to completing his goals, defeating him feels like a real accomplishment, unlike an emerald. On the same token, the plot doesn't take up much of the main storyline, so you're free to skip through all the exposition and ignore the small details if they don't matter to you. After all this, we return to Sinnoh and Cynthia requests that we check in with Professor Rowan, who tells us that the Lake Trio have returned to their homes. Indeed, if you return to any of the lakes, the corresponding Pokémon will be waiting for you. As usual, being legendary Pokémon, they're great additions to your team. Even Mesprit, which takes off as this game's roaming Pokémon with all the frustrations that entails. Route 222 is a brief coastline area, but there's plenty of optional trainer battles if you're falling behind on experience. Sunny Shore is home to the final gym. This one's an electric gym with the puzzles revolving around... Well, revolving walkway is controlled by switches. Different colors rotate the platforms different amounts, but this is only used in the final room's puzzle once. Unfortunately, for being the final gym leader, Volkner is a bit underwhelming. His Pokémon have varied movesets, but none of them directly target the electric type's only weakness. And he only has four Pokémon total compared to Cyrus's five. If you got this far, you'll have no problem getting the Beacon Badge. When we head north, Barry stops us again, having reflected on his loss and vowing to get ahead of us once again. And Jasmine, the same one from Johto, is touched by our friendship and gives us the last ATM we need, Waterfall. If you're so inclined, there's a mountain of little things to collect throughout the region now that we have all the HMs at our disposal, and a few hidden areas tucked away to explore, but we're totally free to head to Victory Road. Victory Road this time around is similar to Generation 3's Victory Road in that it's somewhat labyrinthian, especially in the middle section. There are rooms throughout the sides of the cave that contain small puzzles to progress forward and other small challenges for additional rewards. The main hurdle, though, is the amount of mandatory trainer battles in your way and the variety of Pokémon used. The trainers here are all high-leveled and use many different kinds of fully evolved Pokémon, some of which you might not have seen up to this point. Even when you keep wild encounters at bay with repels, your team is probably going to be very worn down by the time you reach the end of the dungeon. After reaching the league, right as you approach the badge check guard, Barry barrels in to battle us one last time. His team is fully assembled and a force to be reckoned with. His Pokémon have varied movesets designed to cover their weaknesses just like a human-made team generally would. It's not a perfect team, but it's a very solid lineup, especially for an in-game team. It's safe to say Barry is the best rival in the series. Say what you want about his personality, but he has a team designed to challenge you at every turn that follows through on that promise. We're finally at the Elite Four, and starting us off is Aaron, a Bug-type user. Being the first member of the Elite Four, he'll be a major roadblock in making progress from here out. His lead, Yon Mega, has two powerful same-type moves, Double Team, and Speed Boost. If you don't take it out quick, it can very easily tear through an unprepared team and once it's out of the way, he has a variety of Pokémon to contend with. Drapion's typing will throw you off, being Poison Dark, Vespaquin has massive defenses, and Scizor and Heracross are both wicked strong, despite their shared fire weakness. If you're able to overcome his team, it's on to Bertha, a Ground-type user. Since Ground-types are weak to common types, and two of her Ground-types are also Rock-types, you'll probably be able to get through her team with relative ease. 
And Flint, a Fire-type user, is no different, sharing a common weakness with both as Ground-types. Lucian, the last member, can potentially live up to his forebears, but whether or not you get through him easily is more so based around speed than usual. His team is fast and hits hard, but is very frail. If you're faster than him and can hit their weak defenses, you'll get through with relative ease. Finally, we've reached the champion, and as you might have guessed, it's Cynthia. She's by far the most difficult champion the series has to offer, packing a full team that covers its weaknesses very well. Her lead, Spiritomb, is irritating to break through due to its lack of weaknesses and uses its ability, Pressure, to force you to run out of strong attacks. Hulukario, Togekiss, and Garchomp are fast powerhouses with diverse movesets that will tear you to shreds if you give them a chance. And her Milotic and Roserade play similarly to her Spiritomb with more of an offensive edge. Getting through her will absolutely be a challenge, but once you do, you'll be crowned the champion and enter the Hall of Fame once again. As per usual though, there's post-game to cover, so let's jump in. Besides the Pokedex and Pokemon contests, there's quite a bit more to do. If you see every Pokemon in the regional Pokedex and speak with Professor Rowan, Professor Oak will show up to upgrade your Pokedex and Rowan will give you the Poke Radar. A neat side feature that allows you to encounter exotic Pokemon in the grass as well as a potential way to more easily find shiny Pokemon. Oak also mentions Pal Park. You can transfer Pokemon from the Generation 3 games to Platinum and play a short minigame where you recapture your Pokemon and receive various berries as a reward. It's a neat idea, but very tedious in practice, especially since you can only transfer 6 Pokemon per day. If you have a lot of Pokemon to transfer, it'll take a while to get them all again. If you visit Professor Oak in Eterna City, he'll tell you that the legendary birds have started roaming Sinnoh. And there's a small side quest in Canalave that has you visiting Full Moon Island to meet Griselia, which starts roaming the region once you encounter it. Talk to Cynthia's grandmother in Celestic Town and head to Spear Pillar and you can catch Dialga and Palkia. And if you failed to catch Garatina earlier, you can head back to Send Off Spring and explore Turnback Cave, a randomly generated maze with Giratina at the end and a portal to the Distortion World underneath, which gets you the Grisius Orb to switch its forms. The last spot in the legendary hunt is Snowpoint Temple, a brief dungeon with a few ice tile puzzles ending at a statue of a Pokemon. Or so it seems. If you import the Reggie Trio and bring them here, the statue reveals itself to be their master, Regigigas, at a curious level 1. An interesting challenge run candidate at that level for sure. Beyond the legendary hunt, there's a few new places we can explore as well. The basement of Victory Road is opened up to us, where we travel with Marley to the end of the cave, navigating a maze, finding items, and fighting trainers using Pokemon from outside the Sinnoh decks along the way. The cave exits onto Route 224, a winding route with a few more things to see and do, ending at a white rock that had a purpose long ago. The last destination we have to explore is the Battle Zone, a whole new island to explore. Right off the boat, Barry invites you to a multi-battle with Flint and Volkner. You've beat them before, you can beat them again. And after they're defeated, we get this moment and are introduced to Buck before being let go to do whatever we please. The battle zone consists of five long routes in between the main settlements, all of which contain varied landscapes and have exotic Pokemon carried by trainers and available in the wild. This variety serves a threefold purpose. It gives newcomers to the series unfamiliar Pokemon to fight against, as well as something they can look up later on the GTS if they want one of their own, and it contributes to the idea that the battle zone is a place where trainers gather from all over the globe to compete. There's a small post-game story side quest at Stark Mountain, where we see two galactic grunts enter the mountain after we're asked to give chase. We're immediately ambushed by Mars, Jupiter, and Sharon. Sharon six Mars and Jupiter on you for one last confrontation. They're no more difficult than before, and once you trance them both, they decide enough is enough and leave for good. Sharon and the grunts flee further into the mountain without a fight, knowing they have no chance against you. I haven't even mentioned Sharon up to this point since he's such a non-issue in the plot. You never fight him, and at most he makes snide remarks about his colleagues whenever he appears beforehand. As a dungeon, Stark Mountain is multi-layered and confusing, made somewhat worse by the accompaniment of Buck. Though his healing service is useful, you can't use Rock Climb while he's with you. A different perspective on Traversal is nice, but there are much easier routes to the end of the dungeon you could take when he's not with you. At the end, Sharon's plot is thwarted by Master of Disguise, Looker, and the threat of Team Galactic appears to have been permanently put a stop to. 
As a reward for getting through all this, after talking to Buck again, you can return to the final room in Stark Mountain and fight Heatran. A fantastic legendary Pokémon well worth the time and effort to get here. There are three main areas of the battle zone. The fight area, where the battle frontier lies, the survival area, which houses the battlegrounds, a place where you can rematch gym leaders and fight the stat trainers you have accompanied as well as rematch Barry on weekends, and the resort area, where you can visit the ribbon syndicate if you've collected many unique ribbons among your party members to buy ludicrously priced vanity ribbons, as well as getting your own villa, a cute cosmetic money sink that various characters will visit from time to time. Last but not least, the Battle Frontier returns. It's shrunk a bit from Emerald, but it's definitely cut some of the fat from last time. All five facilities are laid out very close to one another with a bazaar in the middle, so navigation is simple and convenient. The Battle Tower and Factory return, working much like last time, and the ultimate goal of facing off against the Frontier Brains twice is the same as well. The Battle Arcade is this game's take on a luck-focused facility, and the best implementation yet. You stop a roulette before every battle to determine what happens during the next round, and if you can master the timing, you can turn the odds in your favor. The battle castle is complex. Your Pokémon aren't automatically healed after each battle. Instead, you earn castle points for each victory in the facility, which can be used towards various things such as healing your Pokémon, giving them a held item, leveling them up, scouting your opponent's Pokémon, and even weakening your opponent with the best options costing the most points. Finally, the battle hall has you take in a single Pokémon and tasks you with taking down the type chart. Ten battles at a time, with the ultimate goal being to finish every type at least ten times, with curveballs in the form of dual types being thrown at you every now and then to keep you on your toes. Although a smaller selection, more attention to detail was given to make these battle formats feel unique from one another, and I'd argue it's all hits this time around. Unfortunately, with Nintendo Wi-Fi being shut down, you can no longer challenge a facility with a friend online, but having that option was fantastic as well. It all adds up to an excellent Battle Frontier experience that, while not perfect, ultimately outdoes what Emeralds accomplished. And with that, Platinum is a wrap. If it wasn't obvious by now, what do I think about it as a whole? Platinum certainly lived up to my expectations, and I would still consider it to be the pinnacle of the series. Sinnoh is a fantastically realized region, and its focus on mythology helps realize it as a place with a sense of history. There are so many things to do and places to explore, both during the main storyline and afterwards. And between the trainers you'll face along the way and the selection of Pokémon available to you, Platinum absolutely nails balance. This is also the best plot a Pokémon game has had so far. There are actual stakes that evolve in a logical way and although you'll be stopped at points as per usual to deal with the evil team, they're better interwoven with the plot this time around. And if you don't care about what's going on, it's easy to ignore and rush your way through. Combine all this with the most advanced battle system so far and the advent of online play, and it's not hard to see why Generation 4 was so influential. That's not to say there aren't shortcomings here. The HM requirements in the game are frankly ridiculous and very difficult to ignore, and the games run at a very slow pace. But if you can put that aside, you'll find a truly fantastic Pokemon game waiting for you underneath. Next time, we'll be looking at a title that tried to reinvent the series and see how well it did in pursuit of that goal. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate it if you could leave a like and or comment down below. And if you want to see more of these long form analysis videos in the future, please consider subscribing. Until next time, I'm Forma, and those are my thoughts.